I'm not going to be looking at just lust and fulfillment as the prize. That's not going to define me. Something else is going to define me. And the reason that something else is going to define me because I was justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Spirit of God, and I was washed and sanctified. Yeah. Yeah. And when humanity in all its brokenness, not pretend humanity, but real humanity, warts and all, is gathered up, then we have what other scriptures call a spirit of freedom. We're no longer slaves to our sweating selves. We rise above just being our sweating selves. But alas, we still sweat. Amen? Amen. Amen. We still sweat. But people will look at me and say, that man's a Christian, not that man's a sweating man. That's where the difference lies. Yes. So, let's look at these two words quickly before we move on to the next scripture. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. Because we could do, you know, we've got about 12 of these to do. Now, I'm only doing two of them today. But, you know, if you want to get a nap and perhaps something to eat and use the bathroom halfway through, then I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, the one thing most pastors don't have a problem with is speaking. Um, the two words in Corinthians, which I have taken their literal meaning, Put it back in. Uh, soft ones and man feathers. Well, they are manakoi and arsenakoita. Now, manakoi literally means soft or softy or soft one. As far as we know, it doesn't actually mean anything else. What it really meant in Greco Roman culture, we really don't have a clue. As I say, you know, it's not good enough to say it's effeminate people because people believe that if you fell in love with a woman, it made you effeminate. There were some very peculiar beliefs around. We know that Paul had a lot of that background. Um, uh, some of his uh, writings are clearly drawing upon Stoic philosophers. His idea of nature and extraordinary nature comes from Stoic philosophy. So we don't really have much of a clue of what he meant. Saying it's a feminine people is just ridiculous. You know, I mean, for the simple reason that I think most people accept that whatever may be due to free will, if somebody's effeminate, it's not due to free will. You know, you only have to be uh, teaching in a school for any length of time, and from three to four years upward, you can see who's going to be blaming. You just can't get away from it. Bless their little hearts. And you can tell them miles. And they go, oh, he's going to have a conversation with my Would be contrary to my nature. 
it would be a very grave sin as well because it would be using a woman for my social acceptance. Yes. Yeah. And many pastors will stand up and tell you that that is better than accepting a homosexual in your midst. Women are dispensable you know, in many branches of Christianity. Women are just there to make the music minister look better. We've all been to churches where that's the case. Yes. You know? And where pastors who seem otherwise quite decent people are willing to sacrifice some poor girl on the altar of their homophobic. It happens a lot. So, we've looked at Malakoi and Arsenicot. Now, what's that told us before we move on? Well, one of the things it's told us is that we can't just assume things. You can't just look at one biblical translation. If you're not going to go back and look at the Greek and the Hebrew, look at a whole bunch. You can get them all compared. And some of the things you see will be truly astonishing. Some of the variations between different translations and some of the ways that some translations of the Bible are always stacked up on one side. The New International Version, for example, work of the devil. The New International Version always chooses the most homophobic interpretation when it has a choice. Now, I know some people like it, and you can filter it, but I can't stand it. There was a version as well called the Good News Bible. I don't know whether that was the video as well. It was big in the UK. It was supposedly the Bible in everyday language. Well, that's so distorted things that it would literally rewrite sections it, uh, that it found too uh, disturbing. So the scene whereby um, in the Last Supper, where Jesus uh, is with, with a beloved disciple, and the original Greek says the beloved disciple rested in Jesus' belly. Mm, what does that mean? Most people say, oh, rested on Jesus' breast. But actually, if you know how people ate in the Greco-Roman world, they ate like this, resting on one elbow, reclining. So your bay is just here. So the beloved disciple rested his head in Jesus' bay upon his son whilst they ate. Well, the Good News Bible find this so disturbing that it says, I'm not going to have any of this nonsense. It says, one of the disciples Jesus loves sat next to him. <laughs> We're not going to have any of that puffy nonsense. Uh, he's going to be sitting next to him. There's an the so you see, you can't trust other people uh, and other people's interpretation. They usually have some hidden agenda. Um, and now we don't have to. Now we can do the work. It's hard work. But it's the only way that we can arrive at any sort of sensible consensus on some of these really big issues. These matter. These really matter. And Christianity has previously got it horribly wrong on many of these big issues. So let's look at Matthew. Matthew 19, 10 to 12. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to take a woman. But he said to them, Not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this. Now, the meaning of this, if we really unpick it, I suggest to you is so wildly surprising that it makes you wonder why we even have this discussion about human sexuality. Because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do the research into what the word eunachos actually meant in the first century. It did not strictly mean somebody who had been physically mutilated, somebody who had been castrated. There were, surprise, surprise, Three different types of eunuch. Who would have thought that Jesus was actually telling the truth when he tells us this? There were eunuchs who were so from birth. There were eunuchs who had been made so from the hand of man. And there were some who had made themselves eunuchs for the glory of God. There were some who were born like it. There were some who were castrated. And there were some who decided that they would give up human relationships for the glory of God. Doesn't that sound a bit like gay folk? Those who are being castrated and those who are celibate. Who would have thought that Jesus was actually saying what he said? Who would have thought that just by looking at a few ancient texts, you could have worked out exactly what he means? And by understanding what Jesus means here, we render completely redundant all the argument about the minutiae of St. Paul all the written arguments about whatever Leviticus might have meant to the ancient Jewish priestly code, because that's exactly 